so we're gonna go ahead and begin. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, and I'd really like to thank our wonderful panelists for coming as well. Some of them drove pretty far to get here, so it's great that they could be here. Um, I'm Caitlin Miller, and I'm the group outreach coordinator here at the GMC, and I'll be moderating tonight's panel. We are very grateful um, to have Orca Media here tonight, live broadcasting it for people at home. Uh, last I checked, registered, we had like 40 people watching at home, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, I believe that this is our seventh year running this event, which is fantastic. It's our most popular workshop. And again, we're really grateful to have our great panelists here tonight. Um, so we can go down the line for the panelists and have them introduce themselves. And I was thinking we could do name, if you through hiked or section hiked, uh, who you hiked with, if anyone, and your favorite place on the trail. I'm sure that it's hard to uh, pick. but. Uh, just kind of to give you an overview of how it runs, uh, we'll, we're kind of kind of shotgun the questions. We're not going to go in any particular order as far as like gear, trail, etc. cetera. Um, and it's really audience driven, so please ask your questions. We have questions from people online, and I have a couple of questions as well to keep it going. So thank you again, and we'll begin. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Kristen. My trail name was Tater, or no, Swift. I hiked with my husband, Fred, whose name was Tater, um, and we hiked the whole thing. We did south to north. Oh, and my favorite, my favorite yeah, spot was uh, Little Rock Pond, because Michaela, if you're watching, awesome caretaker. She was the best. <laughs> uh, my name is Meredith. I hiked, I through hiked um, with a friend of mine, Anna, and my favorite place, um, there's a lot. I think I really liked Puffer Shelter. <laughs> okay, my name is Dave, trail name Evernaught, and I hiked with uh, Jackie, a trail name Key Lime. We section hiked, and uh, our favorite place, a second vote for Puffer. We had spectacular sunset and sunrise at Puffer, it was just uh, it was just uh, breathtaking what we saw. My name is Dick Duquette. Uh, I didn't have a trail name, but I signed all the rosters Thor and I. So when they saw the dog, they said, "You're I." So that's what it was. Everything was Thor and I. He took me on this trip. Uh, I went north to south in the month of September into the beginning of October. Uh, favorite Sterling Pond. It was gorgeous. Nice swimming. Thor loved it. Uh, but for shelters, there's a toss-up between Glen Allen, because that's really the first and beautiful sunrise I saw, and no, sunset, or uh, Montclair Glen. Mm -hmm. It's like a thing you see out of The Hobbit. You come off Camel's Hump, you go down in the shadows, and then there's this little enchanted lodge sitting there. That's what I really like. <laughs> like a kid of me. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Sydney. My trail name was Hummingbird. I hiked with my dad, and my favorite shelter was Montclair Glen because we met a lot of nice people, and it was very cool to stay at. Cool shelter with yeah. uh, My name is Ryan. Um, my trail name was Goose because I was uh, Hummingbird's wingman. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hummingbird really ran the show. She, um, she was pretty much in charge. Um, I threw hiked with her, of course. Um, in my favorite shot, I have to give a vote for Little Rock and Puffer. I, those, I, when you asked the question, I had two in mind, and both of those were both the same spots I was thinking of. Awesome. So as far as answering the questions, um, if you have a specific question for a specific panelist, uh, please feel free to ask that. Otherwise, we'll just kind of go down the whole row so everyone can kind of get, uh, get a chance to talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions to kick us off? Don't be shy. Yeah. I noticed that behind uh, Bolton, the trail is not very well marked there, and I think it might be considered a wilderness area. And so I'm wondering about uh, places where you might have had difficulty finding the trail, and if you have any tools besides a map for you. So I hiked that. I did that section one day from um, Mad River Glen to Mount Mansfield, and it was in January, so certainly it was harder to find the trail. But had we not had uh, um, I guess it was an app that someone had on the phone. We certainly would not have found the trail. So that's a concern of mine is if you try to get lost. 
Um, we didn't get lost, so I think the markings were great. And obviously, when you're with the Appalachian Trail, it's pretty much like a road almost. I mean, it's so pat down. The only part we thought that might be a little bit difficult, especially in the winter, would be, you know, obviously hard to see the blazes. But then when you get further north, it's not as well maintained. So there can be streams and creeks. And we ran across a person that was pretty far up there, and she was like, I was in the water, and I thought I was on the trail, and then I was in the creek, and I wasn't on the trail anymore. So I think when it's pretty wet, you can probably get like led astray a little bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, I don't remember where they were, but there were several sections where we were a little bit frustrated and finding trail marks. And, and, uh, and as far as A's, uh, in addition to the usual uh, map, a couple of things that I found quite helpful at time. One was my iPhone, which I had all the topographic maps on it, so that I could pull up a topo and ask it via satellite where we were. So that was a big help. And also I had an altimeter on my watch, and so I could look at that, and that was also another way to tell us where we were on, on the map, just by altitude. I'm going to add to that. I uh, agree with you. Uh, I went like three, four miles without seeing a blaze in the same section. And common sense, if I hit a blue blade, I'd stop, backtrack, I didn't see any blaze again, and kept going. I knew the general direction I wanted to go. And I had the attitude, I had plenty of maps, and if I come across a road I wasn't supposed to be at, I'll figure out where I'm at and press on. But I knew I could camp anywhere I wanted to. I wasn't worried about getting lost. But I know what you're talking about. I was like... There was like, oh, there was like a few little cat eyes, but that was it. That was it, yeah. Yep. Like I said, a lot of times I woke up and found my because you're daydreaming and watching the dog and found myself looking at blue blazes and have to back up until I saw no blazes and I said, no, I was okay. There was no blazes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, we, at one point, uh, it was after Rolston's rest, we went, there wasn't a double blaze to turn. And we kept going straight, and then we went down a hill, and then we realized we were going the wrong way. And that was really the only time we didn't find our okay. I think like the biggest difference in trail markings were when we were really in the National Forest, and they were trying to have really a, a low impact, uh, I, I guess I would say, experience. Um, you know, you see that there's a lot more down trees across the trail trails less maintained, and the blazes are further apart. And so we had to be a little more careful on keeping our eyes <coughs> for the blazes at that point. Making notes of where to blaze. Um, <laughs> all right, next question. Anybody have one? Um, one that we're getting a lot is, uh, we have a couple from online. Judy from Starksboro is asking, how often did you resupply? Uh, did you send food drops? And uh, specifically, how difficult was it to find stove fuel? So kind of how did you resupply, how often? Mm -hmm. um, we resupplied probably every four-ish days and looked ahead at the map each time we were at a resupply and said, this is the next big town where we can get off. Um, and that looks like it'll take us about four days or something like that. And we didn't do any food drops, and I really liked that because then you're eating what well, you're eating for four days, you get into town and you can say, man, I really want to use this other thing for um, breakfasts or lunches or dinners, and it gives you that little more flexibility to decide what you want to be eating. If you see somebody else on the trail and you really like their food, you can go pick that up at the grocery store. and. Um, some of the big places are Manchester or Rutland. Um, some people stop in Stowe, but I think, um, oh, where was I going with that? Something. What was the rest of your question, Caitlin? Uh, how often, oh, stove fuel. Stove fuel, how do you find stove fuel? Um, stove fuel, so we used an alcohol stove, so um, we tried to, resupply that whenever we were around some sort of outdoor store and a lot of outdoor stores in Vermont will sell um, ethyl alcohol or methyl alcohol folk so you can just fill up the container that you have. Um, s similar we resupplies about every four or five days um, we did do a food cache um, actually right at the bottom of the 
steep steps down to Route 9 before you get to Bennington, and we just like bare bagged it. So then our first couple days in, we didn't have to carry as much, especially since we were just starting out. So we just like went out into the woods. Um, we, I will say a little bit further north, it does get harder and few and far between. And we kept calling Hazen's Notch Visitor Center to see if we could have a food drop there. And they never answered their phone. Huh. So we ended up um, getting it. Our last resupply was in Johnson. And then mm -hmm. we just carried like a whole week's worth of food. But we actually tried to only carry about three to four days of food if possible because we didn't skimp on food. We didn't eat ramen. We tried to eat as well as possible. Maybe our packs were a little bit heavier, but we're really foodie, so we <laughs> wanted to eat well. So we tried to eat, um, have less days. And then the um, gas can be a little bit difficult. We actually ended up um, in Waitsfield. There is an outdoor store, but it's an outdoor store-ish. I mean, don't rely on it. It doesn't have a ton of stuff. Um, we were a little disappointed. So we couldn't get gas there, but we had met a guy who had left some in Warren. We were actually able to pick it up at an auto place. So stove can be a little bit challenging, I think, and we had a trouble in Waitsfield. Okay. Um, we, uh, we got resupplies every four or five days, and the stove wheel was pretty easy because we kind of bought a couple of containers and then when we got resupplied, we just filled up the container we had. So that was kind of easy. Um, my, uh, my mom was my re our resupplier and she brought um, a lot of different kinds of foods for us to bring. Sweet. Sweet. Same here, uh, I had four <laughs> to six days with the food my wife resupplied. She was actually checking up on Thor. She was worried about his paws as he getting with me. I'd see her say, how's Thor doing? Hey, hi, I'm doing fine. <laughs> but uh, it was nice. But like I said, uh, now in hindsight, though, we didn't have the variety that you probably had because we just brought stuff from home that we knew. You know what I mean? So, but that worked for me. He was my old guy trip. I didn't want to waste time going to town. I didn't think uh, Thor would be able to get a ride. And it's really dangerous to him walking on the side of the road to the traffic. Not many shoulders. I was concerned of his safety, so that's why. Uh, so I cheated. My wife picked, did everything for us. It was nice. <laughs> well, we section hiked, like I said, so we resupplied after every hike. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and as far as fuel, the EMS store in Manchester for those little canisters we used on our jet boat. So, mm -hmm. those of you who through hiked, how long did it take you, and when did you do it? What months? Uh, we did in the fall, so we started right after Labor Day weekend. And then we actually spent six glorious weeks on the trail. We weren't in a hurry. We never hiked more than 14 miles in a day, didn't have one blister. And just if it was raining, we stopped. If we wanted to go into town for a couple days, we did. So um, we finished um, October 14th and hiked in one half day of rain. So we took our time. <laughs> um, we ate well. And we ate well, absolutely. Uh, yep. Um, it's a place that no longer exists in the Mad River Valley. Um, it's called the Phantom. It was an awesome place. Close? Yes. Oh, that's cheap. The proprietor even gave me a shoulder a rub, which was awesome. <laughs> and they had very good beer on draft. Um, but uh, the other place was there's a um, kind of fancy place when Manchester Center, a pizza place, has like flatbread pizza, really good beer, it's kind well, of a cafe. I um, we brought those packaged Indian food, which are kind of heavy, but we always had them like our first day. Um, we had, I don't know if you guys know these, we discovered these late, but these like dried, this dried banana jerky from Trader Joe's is the bomb. It's so good and it's really sweet. And um, so um, we tried to bring kale actually <laughs> the first week and it was really hot and I don't recommend that because it tasted all right. But when we opened the bag, we were like, oh my God. Almost knocked over. Um, we did try to bring vegetables. We actually brought peppers because they have a really hard spine. So if you really like jonesing for some fresh food, um, those are some things that you can bring too. Um, we hiked in 18 days. Wow. 18 and yeah, if uh, you just want to keep going with your favorite meal, I think that's a great question for everybody. <laughs> yeah, so. <impressive. laughs> We had started doing, so my favorite meal ended up being a lunch that we had. What was the period of your 18 days? Oh, it was in August. Um, and similarly, we didn't have very much rain. So all. how many miles a day did you do? Sorry, uh, sorry, I'm just going to stop so we can finish the other two questions, oh, and then okay. we'll keep going with more questions. Um, so my favorite food was a lunch, and we had started lunch eating rice cakes and um, tuna packets for lunch, and then 
we ended up deciding to go for tortillas and Nutella and peanut butter, and that, that, those, that's the best lunch. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll be in section eight, but I'll answer your questions anyway. It took us four years. <laughs> <laughs> there were some extenuating circumstances, but anyway. Like kind of uh, and uh, our favorite meal, meal, meal was uh, Mountain House Inflatable Chicken a la King, followed by Mountain House Inflatable Raspberry Crumble. <laughs> uh, took us 21 days, Thor and I. Uh, we started beginning of uh, September, finished late uh, Columbus Day, due to math doesn't work. After my second week, I. My boss was screaming, I had to go to work every Monday and Tuesday for the last part of the trip. I'd hike Wednesday through Sunday. But I'd lose a half a day on Wednesday, half a day on Sunday. But actual hiking days was 21 days. Uh, I, I'm with you, in the, I'm with you. Uh, my wife would drop off fresh veggies at the beginning of the week. I had carrots, onions, peppers. I know it was good for two days, but I kept them in my pack. Cheese is good for four days in your pack, keep it out of the sun. Summer socks, if you don't open it, it keeps forever. Once you open it, you got a couple days to eat it with pita bread, bread because it's already crushed, already flat. Pita's great. Uh, I never use any freeze-dried granola, oatmeal, uh, dried apricots, raisins. I gave up gorp about five years, six years ago. I just couldn't choke it down anymore, so now <laughs> it's just all fruit. Uh, nice to be a hamburger helper. Uh, without the hamburger, of course, I'd have it. Uh, in the wintertime, I use the hamburger helper with the hamburger, but in the summertime, just the seasoning. You know, noodles with lasagna, noodles with beef stroganoff, just leave out the hamburger. But you can add tuna fish. You add tuna fish to anything. It's not heavy. Even though it's not a tuna helper, it's hamburger helper, add tuna fish to it. It's meat, it's protein, it's awesome. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, it took us 28, 27 days to hike, hike the whole long trail. We, my favorite, uh, my favorite food was a breakfast. We got a milk milkshake packets, and we put some freeze-dried milk and water in them, and put some granola in, and they were pretty good for breakfast. <laughs> and so we hiked um, from late June, early July. Um, and it rained a little bit in June um, on us. My favorite meal was probably dinner because that was where I got my salt intake with the amount of water we drank throughout the day. Um, and usually it was cuckoos with bouillon and olive oil or even rice. We definitely chose not to just get the dehydrated food. Um, we were okay with the amount of food drops we got, we were okay with um, some food that we could simmer and add some spice and flavor and um, kind of make really our own thing for dinner. So dinner was never the same, but it was always my favorite meal. <laughs> always be sure we pack an extra day. I always had six days of the food, but I plan my stops four to five days out. Always have an extra day. Stuff happens. I spilled fuel on some of my food one time, stupid, throw it into mine one time. Or you find somebody who didn't plan, you're able to give meals away, which is a really sweet thing. That's paying for it also. But always, always pack an extra day longer than you think. It's not that heavy. Even just ramen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, right there. Did you have to hang your food from the trees? I, uh, I started hanging it, because uh, that's what, for environment, with varmints and stuff, but I really had a door. That dog never slept. We didn't have a critter within 10 feet of the sleeping bag. Uh, Mark Clay Glenn, they had a bear box, because they had trouble with bears in August. But if they had a bear box, I used it. But otherwise, uh, you should hang it, you know, but I didn't this trip. I started to, and I stopped. Well, we always hung our food. There, there's all the, all the uh, shelters have various Ropes or strings hanging down with, yeah. with uh, little things so that the rodents can't get up. And we usually put our food up there. As far as being bothered, there was only one shelter, and I'm sorry, I forgot the name without looking at my notes, but uh, the mice were unbearable. They didn't get into our food, but they were scurrying around all night long in every place. It was, uh, uh, you know, we were hanging and everything. Didn't, didn't disturb them. <laughs> wow. It was non-stop running around the, the, the shelter. 
we pretty much hung our food most of the time, and actually our, our boots and packs and everything, because our first shelter people scared the heck out of us by saying that uh, porcupines were gonna eat our boots or our poles, the top, chew on anything where they're salt. And so we started hanging things and we pretty much did bear bag, sometimes because it's just fun actually to try to find a branch and then try to like get it over. Um, and just to like, because if you're gonna hike out west too, it's a good skill to be able to have because the bears are a lot more aggressive than they are here. But um, definitely pretty much tried to hang everything off the ground unless we were in a shelter. <laughs> We, we, uh, we put our stuff on these ropes with a stick on them where you would hang them and people would put tuna, tuna fish cans or soup cans or just anything on them and then the mice couldn't get into your bag. So when you hang, hung your bag on them, the fish, or the uh, mice couldn't get into it. Um, there was one shelter, Minerva, McKin McKinney, I think. Um, uh, there, uh, it's been eaten by porcupines, pretty much. Everything has been like, like bitten and chewed on by porcupines, and we tried to keep all our stuff off the ground at, there. <coughs> Um, I think last year there was, um, well, we experienced a bear in the area where we hiked after Camus Hump. Mm -hmm. um, we came, we actually walked into a shelter the night before uh, a canister was taken from the caretaker in the area. And so that was kind of like the beginning of bringing out the bear boxes and being more uh, aware of bear. And so we were aware of what we should have done with our food at that point as we hiked north. We did hang our food a couple of times, but um, we probably should have done better, and I'm sure Green Mountain Club would probably say the same thing. Uh, just a GMC PSA, the bear population in Vermont is growing, so uh, it's not you know a huge problem like it is in New Hampshire and the Adirondacks, but it's always a good thing to consider uh, bear safety and uh, bear-proof storage and things like that. I also used just the hanging things in the shelters, and when we weren't staying in shelters, um, I would just wing it. But I did have a rope for bear bagging just in case, which was, I think, the only thing I didn't use the entire time I was there, but it, it feels like you should have it because you can hear stories going along the trail. Like when I was hiking in August, there was a lot of bear activity on Camel Sump, so um, had I been sleeping there when that was going on, it would have barebacked. Or I guess they had put in the bear boxes at that point. But um, it is something important to have, I think. As someone who takes nothing extra, it's like that's a good thing to have, mm -hmm. um, just in case. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Mary, you sort of just answered the question, but what was the piece of equipment you each had that you didn't really use, and what did you wish you had if that happens? I'll just elaborate on what I was saying then. The rope is the only thing I didn't use, and um, I didn't wish I had anything else. And I really liked everything I took with me, which I know is a, a, not a very useful answer, but I would love to. I'll go into depth of what I did have if you'd like. Um, but there wasn't, there was, I never had to mail anything home or, or say like, hey, I really wish I had, etc. Um, we brought gators, which we really didn't need, and we even brought the tall ones, and most of the AT through hikers just have those short ones. Um, I will say um, I had this awesome Nemo pad, blows up to about that big. It's a total luxury. It was like two and a half pounds, but I slept awesome every single night. My husband had one of those super thin thermo rests, and he was like complaining the whole time. So if you like sleep and you don't mind a little extra weight, having some a good sleeping pad is just makes a huge amount of difference. And I feel like that's one of the things that is worth having an extra pound. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think there was anything that uh, we didn't actually use. Uh, so I'd have to, the only thing to fit into your, th into your question would be we, did, we j did shed the top half of our boots halfway through. So we were wearing over the ankle boots on the southern half, and then we, we switched to uh, under the ankle shoes after that. And, and uh, uh, so 
I think there was, my, my partner mentioned a couple of things that she felt missing. One was, there were a couple of times when we were in, uh, stayed in the shelter in the fall that it got older that she was comfortable with her, with her sleeping system. Uh, so she would have liked a little, something a little warmer. And also on, on one time we stayed in the shelter for a couple of nights, she forgot her Crocs and she didn't like getting up in the middle of the night and having to put on her boots to go out and you know, do her do her thing. So, uh, so the things that we forgot were missed. And, uh, and other than that, the only th other thing we wish we didn't have was weight. Anything you can do to cut weight was something that was always on our mind. I, uh, I had 100 feet of parachute cord that I didn't use, but that'd be in case you needed something for hanging bear stuff or whatever. Something broke. I had a half a roll, roll of duct tape. People take a little bit of duct tape, put it under pencil. I brought half a roll with me because I wasn't sure how Thor was going to do with his paws. And my plan was I had a, I had a bunch of moleskin. I'd wrap up his paws with moleskin and duct tape if I needed to. Well, there was a young lady who had a dog going the other direction in a lab, and uh, the pack was falling apart. And when she saw my half roll of duct tape, uh, she just, her eyes bugged out. I said, go ahead, take it. <laughs> it was like the second week, and I didn't need it anyway. So I didn't need the duct tape really. Uh, Thor's paws were fine. Uh, parachute cord in need. But everything else, I've been, I've been packing a long time. I was pretty much spot on. That red right pad you see here on the on the side here, see all scratched up. That was Thor's. I cut a piece of that back from '78, and that's what he would sleep on to keep him off the ground and stuff. He'd scratch it up, and that was his. But uh, yeah, I pretty much had a spot on. I, I we didn't really bring anything that we didn't need. There wasn't really anything that we needed or didn't need. I brought a pair of sunglasses that didn't last very long, because <laughs> you don't need them. It's, you know, you're walking under a canopy of, of trees, and, you know, and when you did see the sun, it, you didn't really need your sunglasses. So leave the sunglasses at home. You're right, I brought sunglasses, I didn't use them either. I had my pack the whole time. <laughs> yep, right, no thought of that. Home. Well, my partner has very sensitive eyes and she wore sunglasses yeah. almost the entire trip. <laughs> oh, we've been getting, kind of going back to your earlier question, we've been getting a lot of questions online about pacing, like how did you plan your mileages, what, were, what was your average miles a day, uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we probably went between 8 and 10 miles a day, and it was mostly based on the shelters, how much food we had. There were a couple days that we really pushed it, but we just wanted to like take our time or go for a swim if there was an opportunity or you know things like that. So we just really kind of slow and steady. We planned our pacing by looking at the map and deciding when um, we'd resupply next, like I said. and. Um, seeing if there were any sites along the way where we wanted so wanted to stop. So it's a, it was a really day-by-day day thing. Um, and our miles were anywhere from, our lowest day was four miles and our highest day was 25. But we averaged around 17. So um, you, we would just take that in, to, into consideration and average a little under. So we'd say like, okay, we'll estimate like 13 to 15 miles a day and then um, like Dick was saying, and then we would have, we would have like an, an extra meal or so um, at the end if we went faster than that. Yeah, as, as section hikers, the main consideration for us uh, was getting on and off the trails. So we had to look for side trails, and the other thing that was a big factor was getting rides and help uh, getting to and from the trailheads. Uh, so uh, as far as uh, distance. Uh, I think we picked up one tiny piece that we missed because of Hurricane Irene. That was our lowest day. It was two miles. And the longest we did was, I think, around 14. And the average, including side trails, was, uh, was around seven, a little over seven for us. My problem was I tried to plan, and I was horribly off. Just a little background. Last summer, I got shingles and got Lyme disease because I went through last. So come August, I wasn't fit where I wanted to be. So I thought the long trail would be my get back in shape plan. Don't do that. Get in shape before you start the long trail. <laughs> first, the first leg, I told my wife, oh, 15 miles a day, five miles. Pick me up here at 75 mile mark at, jo at Johnson. Is it Johnson? Well, I made it past Belvedere, and that was my 
my fifth day and she had to pick me up. I was the first day I did six miles, made a pot of coffee about one o'clock, didn't move after that. <laughs> Next day I did eight miles, about two in the afternoon, made a pot of coffee, I was good. <laughs> but then as we got further on, then I started averaging uh, 12, 15 miles a day. And my last three days were 19 mile days, so they're really nice, flat, easy going. But uh, yeah, so I was between eight and 15 miles a day, depending on how I felt. It was a nice thing, pot of coffee. Sterling Pond coffee. It was an old guy hike. I liked it. <laughs> um, we, um, at, before I went to bed each night, I usually tried to plan the next day. Um, some days we, so the least we did was at eight, uh, the first day, which was seven miles. The most we did was 18. And our average was between 10 and 15 miles. Smoking. Yeah. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> um, I think, like Sydney said, you know, we really kind of planned our, our, our walk the night before. Um, but there's a lot of factors in weather and how we felt. Um, we also kind of caught the end of, or part of a bubble of the Appalachian Trail. So there was a group of people that we kind of became friends with and wanted to walk with them and wanted to be with them at the end of our day. And so we started planning our walks on finding an end point with the rest of the group. Um, and since they were through hikers, they weren't fast through hikers on the Appalachian Trail, but they were in way better shape than we were. So we found like the first couple of days we tried to keep up with them, it was very difficult. Um, but we got, we got our legs and, and really started to keep up with them. And we we're glad we kept those relationships. So I got us, I, kind of peer pressure kind of helped us plan our way through it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering about September, we had a trouble. We started off, we had trouble. Uh, the first shelter was Shooting Star. Uh, they said there was supposed to be a pump somewhere. I couldn't find a pump at lunch. And when I started in September, I thought I took September to be cool. If you remember last September, it was 85, 8.85. Thor drank a lot of my water, and I thought I did. I brought an extra algae bottle for Thor, and he ate like two, he drank like two and a half. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was pumping out of mud puddles and stuff until I got probably the first, until I got past. Jonestown, right? Jones, Borough, Jonestown? Jonestown. Jonestown. After that, we started getting more red. But well, I expected it to be dry in the fall, but it was really dry up north. It was like mud. You know, that's just me, you know. August, we didn't have any problems. August was really dry, and we didn't get rained on a lot. Uh, but there was still plenty of water running from the, the summer that had been somewhat wet earlier on. And then, I had a friend who hiked in September, and you guys can speak to this much more than I can, but then because August and September were both dry, I think she had a little bit more trouble um, yeah. finding water occasionally, but not not chronically had trouble with water, I don't think. Yeah. We were a little bit worried about it, and there probably were stretches where we went without water for a little while in between the shelters, but there's a few places like Stark's Nest um, after Lincoln Gap where there's a warming hut and they actually have a rain barrel and we weren't sure but some people were coming down in the south and they told us that there was water in there and then there was one spot, um, I'll have to remember, someone had actually left some just jugs of water, a trail angel, so mm -hmm. maybe like one or two times were we concerned but it really was not bad and September was pretty hot and we were talking about actually we finished close to around Columbus Day and it was 70 degrees on Jay Peak, so it was pretty hot, like, and then a week later it snowed, so it was pretty hot all the way up through October. But really water, even in those conditions, um, water was really not that hard to find. Uh, we had one shelter where the water wasn't very good. It was Serendine, and um, you had to walk through the woods a little bit to get to it, and then it was just a little spring, and you had to filter your, you had to get a, you had to like use a pump filter to get it, because it was in a big pit, and it was kind of hard to get it out. So that was the only place we really did water. Did you have all the water? Yeah. 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 Yeah
all have water purifying systems? Mm -hmm. with you? My favorite piece of equipment, my cation uh, pump. I had a cation uh, burial pump I've had for 10 years, and I love it. That's what I use. We have yeah, one. We alternate. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please. <laughs> but we alternated between, uh, what's it, murine, the, the two, the two uh, little bottles of liquid, aquamarine. Yeah. And the other one, I think the one we really liked the best was the uh, Sawyer. Uh, filter that was very convenient because you could fill it up and you know you got water instantly if you were running a little bit dry when you got to the water line you get a drink right away so that was that was probably our preferred uh, I, I made an invention on the trail which I'm trying to get out and when I get it I'll, I'll show you the because again it hasn't hit to do with water anybody else have different methods for purifying um, we had a catadine, but it got a little bit clogged the first week because we did a blue blaze to um, North Bourne Pond, which I actually highly recommend. It's a blue blaze, but beautiful. We had the whole place to ourselves and the raloons, and it was great. But um, it was uh, there was a lot of sediment, so it got clogged. Then it got really slow, <laughs> but it gave us lots of time to relax. And we know a lot of people Sawyer. use yeah Sawyers, and you know it's kind of mixed results. Like a lot of people had it. I'd be curious, Meredith's experience, but the bags can pop and you know. So, yeah, so we had something similar to that. So here is my m most important water collecting item, because many places the water is only about a millimeter deep, so yeah. you've got to have some way of scooping it up. So having a, cu a, a cut-off water bottle was really great for that. Water filtration is a crazy debate. I would say that you just need to get online and see what's going to work best for you. They talk about um, bacteria now that could be in the water sources, not only um, you know the big honking bugs that make you uncomfortable on the trail. Um, some filters filter bacteria, some filters don't. Some say you should like the Sawyer does a great job of being convenient and is lightweight, but it doesn't get the bacteria, so you should follow that up with tablets. Really, there's a debate on it. Some people and don't filter either. Um, so we chose to use a pump um, system, and I chose that for the health of both of us, um, and I was willing to carry the extra weight for it um, because I thought that was really important. Um, other people are willing to take the chances of not doing that. Thank you. Two hundred pounds for water. You need I'm, I'm going to respectively disagree. Uh, we can we can research this afterward, but I'm pretty sure the Sawyer is very effective on bacteria. The thing it's not effective on are viruses, but viruses I think is not a problem on the trail here. The most important thing that's the problem here is the Cryptosporidium and the Giardia which are great big things, and, and, and the Sawyer filter is great for getting those out. Whereas, on the other hand, some of the other things, like the Aquamere, uh, it can get at things like Cryptosporidium, but you have to let it work for like an hour or more, because yeah. they have very thick uh, shells, and, and the chemical treatments take a long time. So um, that's why one of the reasons we, we, we went with the Sawyer filter for, for the most part, once we found it. If you've never seen a bladder like this, MSR, I've had it about 10, 15 years. I think they still make it. It holds four liters. It's awesome, you put it in your pack. At the end of the day, you fill this with four liters, fill you to an algae, and you have water for supper and breakfast. You find you think you're gonna have a dry spell because someone's going out in the direction saying, hey, there's no water for the whole day. You've got this, doesn't take any weight, you fill it up, and you put it in your pack. It weighs, this heavy, it's four liters. Mm -hmm. It weighs six, seven pounds, but I mean, I've gone a week without touching it, and all of a sudden I needed to fill up with a dog or somebody. I had a couple that wanted to sleep on Belvedere on a tower, a young couple. And they're going uh, ahead of me, and I was, I was stopping at Tulasin Creek, and they wanted to sleep at Belvedere, and they didn't have enough water. So I said, fill this, take this, leave it at the bottom of the fire tower, tower when you're done. I'll pick up in the morning. And it was great. It doesn't weigh anything, doesn't take any room. You know, it's awesome. Just a little bladder. Just a, another GMC PSA, we do recommend that you treat all backcountry water. Uh, Giardia has been found up as high as, I believe, 12,000 feet. 
and water running, so it is in Vermont, and it will have you firing out of both ends. So it doesn't get you sick for two weeks, so wait till you get home, then you have a special. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, for those of you who are, may not be familiar with the Sawyer system, this is it. Uh, it's got a little bladder. You fill this up with water, and you take this thing, and you screw it on there, and just squeeze, give it a little pressure, and out comes this um, and I chose to get the slightly larger filter. It's a couple ounces heavier, but it does filter faster. And one of the big debates about filtering water is that it slows you down. I met a couple of people who said they just don't filter their water because it takes them less time to have diarrhea once in a while than to actually filter their water. I don't recommend that. But, yeah, I, I mean, I don't recommend that at all. But uh, I did like having the slightly larger one because you can just, it, you don't have to wait as long. I just want to add some things to the filters, but um, the one that I use is a platypus. And I don't know if you've seen those before, but it actually attaches to my, to my bladder hose. And so you can insert it through the hose and then you can just fill your bladder and go, and that's super and you can do that with this thing too. You can suck on it. Yeah. People will connect these to just a water bottle also. So I never had one of these break, but um, if you do, you can just screw it on a plastic bottle. Yeah. Awesome. Anybody else? Questions? Yeah. Just sort of answer that. How much water per day per person did you guys typically carry? I carry two liters, and in the fall, I use one liter. I mean, what was the capacity, I mean, just like? Uh, 64 ounces. And I grabbed another 32 ounces for Thor. But I'm kind of fine out, I gave that up after two weeks. He was drinking, he would get ahead of me and just drinking the worst stuff, and he never got sick. So I just stopped caring about it him. Get rid of his bottle. <laughs> but at 64 ounces, it's comfortable for me. What are you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, whenever we hit, we're at a water source, we, we filled up two liters. So we, I guess, uh, except maybe, between. Maybe I'm not clear, like what did your pack hold? Like what did your bladder have and your now leave that hold? What did you feel comfortable carrying to the as far as not running out of water? We carried. Was, like I said, two liters. So it was either, and I carried it either in an empty throwaway water bottle, which is nice and light, much, much lighter than the Nalgene bottles that they sell you in the camping stores. And the other thing I used, especially toward the end of the trip, was a. Uh, you know, a bladder in, in the backpack. Uh, as far as how much water, uh, that was really sort of the minimum. I tried to drink as much water as possible. Usually, got some water on the way. We carry two of these each. Um, they're lightweight. Um, they're pretty durable. And we filled up two or three times a day. Um, that's all it really took. Um, we felt, sometimes we felt like it was too much water because water is heavy. I mean, it really is, is heavy. So if you know that there's a, you're on a section that has a lot of water sources, we would only fill one up and make sure that we um, at least had one liter that we were drinking off of all day. So I'm just curious if anyone, when you're uh, hiking, you know, situated on hydration hose, so you could just drink as you went, just mm -hmm. the convenience versus taking the path all the way off, if that was helpful. Yeah, well, like I said, I, I used that for roughly the last half of our trip to use the bladder, <laughs> and it was convenient for that, because you just... Yeah, mine just, you know, I had it kind of coming through the yeah. front, and then yeah. I could just, like, pull it up. But just one thing to be aware, we got to a spot, I think it was Mount Abe, where, um, it was lean, somehow my pack was leaning on it, and then the water actually started coming out quite a bit, and that was one of the places where we were worried about water. So just, if you are gonna use one of those, just make sure, because maybe you're tired, we just like hiked up Mount Abe, we were hungry, I just put my pack down. Then all of a sudden I looked, and there was all this water on the ground, and I was like, oh God. So you just have to be a little bit careful, but it's so convenient. And my husband had a Nalgene, and if you're trying to move, it's hard to just like keep stopping and taking it out. And so I, I recommend the bladders for sure. Just make sure it doesn't leak. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm sorry, the only, the only disadvantage of the bladder is that you can't tell how much you have left. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to 
That's what I was going to say. I'm old school. I use an allergy and I'm old school. Um, I get thirsty, but I need to take my pack off for five minutes until my shoulders are great. Drop it, and I know exactly how much I have. I'm freaking fast, freaking slow. <laughs> Put it back on and go. Sometimes I'll go an hour and a half, two hours. Sometimes I'll go 45 minutes. It all depends how I feel, but I'm old school. Now it means. And our bags had uh, bottle holders that were situated right, basically right here on our hip, so we could just reach back, grab our bottles, drink as we go, and put them back. And I carry my platypus in the side pocket, because um, then you can tell how much you have, and it's way easier to grab it when you need to fill it back up. You don't have to go inside your pack or like unstring a complicated system. Um, yeah. Did, uh, were, were you all in good shape when you did your tracks? And I'm going to ask a bunch of different questions that I'm fascinated. Did you do any exercise while you were hiking? In other words, did you limber up or anything like that? Or stuff like that? And did you all just ever feel like dying? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. did, you always, did you feel like you were always strengthening your legs? And, or did you ever wonder <laughs> when you were hurting yourself? The, uh, well, I told you I, I had shingles and uh, Lyme disease, thank you, last summer, from uh, May till August. When I got over that, I said, well, I didn't have any respect from my mountains. I'm from New Hampshire originally. I'm going to go rolling hills. It'd be a nice hike to get in shape. That was a mistake. The first three or four miles, you go from Canada down nice and rolling. Then you stop Doll P, D O L L P, halfway up. I stopped, threw my pack off, dying. Like, open my map, I'm like, what am I climbing that's kicking my butt? And it was only like a 2,400 footer, but it was straight up. My first straight up one. My glutes were hurting, my legs were hurting. But after you guys were tested, after three or four days, you get to hiking legs. Maybe five days it takes to get to hiking legs, and you just press. And uh, yeah. But you probably should, shouldn't do it like, like I did. You should go to probably in better shape. <laughs> no. Well, one benefit going from south to north is it's a little bit gentler when you're, I mean, that's why we decided to do it. It definitely gets steeper and you have higher elevation mountains when you get higher. And, you know, I mean, some of it really is just straight up, you know, the trail is built in 1910. So there's like no switchbacks. There is almost like a low level of rock climbing where you kind of have to like get your leg up on a boulder and then like grab for a branch and then heave yourself up. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, those are some challenges. And then, you know, there's just a lot of elevation gain and loss. I mean, you're just constantly going up and down. And then, especially in the southern part, you get to the top and the only reason you know you got to the top is you're going down. There's no view, they're just surrounded by spruce trees and it's great, but sometimes you get up and you're like, really? There's not even a view? I just did all that? <laughs> so, but you do, yeah, there's no sign. It's not like you're at top of Mount Washington. Like, nope, you have no idea. But, and you'll cover, you know, many peaks in a day. But you definitely, after I think probably the first couple of days, you, you really kind of get into the groove. Um. We, when, to get ready, we, um, we have a lot of short little day hikes that we can do right after school. And after school, we would grab our bag, put a rock in it, and then go hike up, <laughs> up, up the mountain, and then come home and eat dinner. And then, okay. The important thing is don't wait till you're going to get in shape to do the hike. Just do it. You'll get in shape yeah. as you go. You'll start slow. You have a four-mile day, a six- and eight-mile day. Yeah. But otherwise, you'll never do it. Don't wait till you get in shape. Just do it. But go smile and bring people food and water. All right? Just do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, as uh, the senior crew here, uh, <laughs> we had to get in shape. And the way we got in shape was doing a lot of hiking. So we did most of our hiking in August and September. And June and July, we were hiking. You know, yeah. Not quite as intensely and so on, but uh, you know, that's the best way to get in shape for, because it's not just stamina and, and going to the gym. I mean, it's, 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 it's your footing and so on. I mean, you got to get, the thing about the long trail, especially the northern half, is that you're constantly walking on rocks or mud or tree roots and, and it's just, that's what you need to train on. You can't just say, hey, I've got good cardiovascular. It's, it's, it's all of it. Uh, yeah. Was there a time when, when we thought we, I wanted to die? <laughs> uh, actually, there, was, there were two occasions. For that. <laughs> uh, the easy one was coming, coming up the forehead. 
uh, when I didn't, when I thought I might die a couple of times <laughs> if I couldn't find something to grab onto. Okay. The one where I wanted to die was we were we did a um, a, a planned three night uh, backpack from. Uh, from Appalachian Gap to D Duxbury Road. And the first two nights went well, except that the hut or the shelter we stayed in before we were about to take on Camel's Hump, unfortunately it rained all night, which, which we dreaded because it meant everything was going to be wet. Uh, so we went ahead, we went up Camel's Hump. As we were approaching the summit, we ran into a thunderstorm. So we decided that we were not going to try to go up on top while it was lightning. Uh, we took the summit roundabout, which was a very difficult trail in itself. And uh, coming down that trail, uh, my partner was just a little bit ahead of me. We were coming down a fairly steep slab, and it was slippery. And uh, she got about halfway down and did a, a head first dive down to the bottom. And I watched her and said, gee, I hope she's not hurt. The next thing I knew, I took a head a dive down. She landed in some bushes, so there was no problem. I was stopped by a tree. Uh, so I was feeling a little bit worse. Okay, and I'll come back to that. But anyway, we continued on. It was very difficult because it was slippery and it, was, it, was, it wasn't really pouring, but it was raining off and on. The thing that saved us, we ran into a couple of trail angels, including two young men who not only offered to guide us down the last half to get down to Duxbury Road, but they actually carried our packs for us. Wow. <laughs> Still and all, we were on the trail that day for 13 hours. Wow. And then when we got down, we were walking with flashlights in at night. And uh, Stuff, hey. yeah, uh, when we got back on the way down, uh, there were times when I <laughs> felt like, and uh, I probably would have been, felt worse if I had known what I found out two days later, which was that I had suffered a, a minor concussion and a broken collarbone in my in, <laughs> encounter with the tree. So uh, it's it's really was very fortunate that we ran into these trail angels because I think if I had finished that hike you know, with a full pack on, it, it probably wouldn't have done my, my shoulder much good. Um, we hiked Baker Peak, and it was really cold, and it was starting to snow and hail, and we got up there, and we were freezing cold, and it was just a slab of rock, and then we walked on the ridge, and it was really cold, by the time we got down to the shelter, when you tried to like tie your shoe or something, you couldn't because your hands were so cold. Mm -hmm. What month was this? Uh, end June, June. End of June. There was a storm last summer that blew through at the end of June, and uh, it was there is a windstorm, and there was a cold front that followed that right behind it. And we hunkered down most of the morning um, to wait out the rain, and it finally cleared out, and we didn't realize that there was a cold front coming down. And along with a cold front, you know, there's also rain or participation that comes down. And when we got up to that peak, we were exposed, and it was sleeting sideways on us. And we kind of had to, like, work together and, and get through this really uncomfortable situation of, of being cold. And, had the idea of working together to um, get to the shelter that night. And that's just, you know, kind of the trail and, and, and being partners and teammates when you're hiking with someone is one person's not going to have a very good day and the other one has to be there to help them out. And that was one of those times, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, uh, we ended up going to Little Rock that night and it was much warmer and amazing. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> We swam in the pond. And... <laughs> I think 
Baker has the bypass, doesn't it? Mm. Baker Mountain has a bad weather bypass. Mm -hmm, but we didn't realize that it was going to be snowing once we get up there. <laughs> it does have a bad weather bypass, but uh, we, were already, we were already committed. Fly the pass. Mm -hmm. Just, oh, sorry. Uh, just in terms of while you're on the trail, I think I would just reiterate everything they said that you get in shape while you're going. My partner and I run a lot, but it doesn't, I mean, it's totally different. It's about being on your legs all day on rocks and mountains. Um, so do your first couple of days at four miles or whatever works for you. But limbering up on the trail, I really liked um, sitting with my legs against the side of the shelter or um, up against a tree or something every night just to like let the blood drain out of them for five or 10 minutes before I went to bed. And then it feels good to do a couple jumping jacks and like stretch a little bit in the morning. I, I think stretching in the morning um, can set your day off right and it helps your body feel a little bit better. But that being said, not everyone does it. Uh, but I do think that um, elevating your feet a little bit at night helps them from getting very swollen the next day. Use an Nalgene bottle, throw all your calves and stuff. Kept me from getting Charlie horses at night. I use this to just roll up my muscles and stuff. It helped, it helped out. A young lady told me to do that because I was having trouble with Charlie horses. That I wasn't getting enough salt. I'm loading salt in my food. And she's like, take an Nalgene bottle, and just roll up my muscles. Awesome, brilliant. <laughs> so we've had quite a few questions online. Um, Asking, let's see, Becca from Concord asks, what type of shelter you use, tent, hammock, etc. And also, did you use your shelter? Did you mostly stay in the shelters on the trail? <laughs> so we're dorks. We calculated how much we did. Um, so we camped for 10 nights, shelter for 21 nights. Um, three nights we stealth camped in a... Um, in our tent and then um, eight nights in various hostels and B&Bs and stuff. Um, but, so we probably did like a mix, but um, as folks have mentioned, the northern part has Montclair Glen, Blair, Taft, just really lovely four-sided lodges. So we felt like we could have ditched our tent for like the northern part. Um, but we did stay in some shelters and sometimes, sometimes we just decided not to or sometimes they just weren't very inviting. <laughs> so it was a mix. We didn't bring a tent, um, so we stayed in shelters, and then sometimes we would just cowboy camp on our on our pads with nothing. If it's if it's gonna be nice. <laughs> uh, we brought a tent on the first couple of uh, backpacking trips, but we found the shelters were readily available, and so we we ditched. That was two pounds that we ditched for the rest of the time. And the only we never had any trouble getting in. Uh, in the shelter, and the only thing we did is one precaution was when we were hiking in the fall, when the kids come back to school up in the area of UVM and so on, we checked the, the Green Mountain to see where there were any groups uh, signed up to, in, for the shelters that we wanted to use. So we, we, we did avoid that yeah. uh, intentionally. But, uh, we, 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 anytime we stayed on the trail, it was in the shelter. I, I, can I just follow up with that? Yeah. Do you guys have, do tell groups do that, tell you that they're going to be there? I'm so glad I'm sure you asked that. They don't that. all do that. Like, do, <laughs> yes. Register. Groups of 10 are supposed to register, right? Yep, so we have, uh, again, not all the groups because we can capture all the users of the trail. Some people just don't contact us, but there is www.greenmountainclubgroups.org, um, and you can click on a shelter that you are thinking about staying at and see when uh, hiking groups are staying there as well. One plus about some of the groups is we ran across Princeton that was camping in a couple different places and they had some extra food. <laughs> so sometimes if you have a big college group, they have leftovers, which <laughs> is much appreciated. And we actually were, they were all really great. So we just didn't stay in the shelter with them, but they were awesome. So don't be deterred if there's a group, just maybe know that the shelter might be filled, but you might get free food. <laughs> I brought a tent because my wife insists on it. She's getting over Lyme, Lyme disease. We camped at the trailhead in Canada. She spent the night with me, and I kept the tent in the car because there wasn't any bugs, so I said, I don't need it. I had this. I used it four nights. Uh, one shelter, somebody was allergic to dogs. One shelter, they just didn't like dogs. Look at that. So when that happened, I thought I could throw outside and sleep in the shelter, all the whining. I took out my old tarp and me, throw it, set it up, keep it due off us, and we slept outside. 
a few nights, and that was it. At one time, I used that as an emergency, my sterling pond, my favorite one. But I got the one in the afternoon, so rain was coming in. I wanted to get over to Mansfield before it rained, so I went down to Smuggler's Notch, get to the picnic, picnic area, think I'm going to sleep underneath the picnic table. No camper allowed. So I went back a quarter mile in the woods, set up my little tarp, and we spent the night. Then I was able to make over Mansfield before it rained and stuff like that. So spray a tarp, it weighs about a pound, and you never know if you need it. Um, we use, we didn't use a tarp like this. We used a actual, a different type of tarp that's a tent, kind of, with a bug net. And we used that twice. We used it one day because we got to the shelter at one, and we figured we could go three or four miles. We got uh, below Stratton Mountain. And then the next time we did, was the last day we were on the trail, the last night. Uh, the shelter was full and because the a southbound bubble was coming through. So we set up our tar our tarp. Um, right behind the shelter. Yeah, right yeah. behind the shelter and it was how did it? Uh, luckily enough we didn't get rained on. There was a couple of times where um, the shelter was full by the end of the night, so if you know you're going to be, if you anticipate showing up to a shelter around dinner time, you might not find a spot, especially when the Appalachian Trail bubble was going through. Um, from what I understand this year, it's a record year for the Appalachian Trail, so if you're expecting to do south to north, expect to have company up until Killington, and it might be a lot. Um, I would recommend bringing a tent or some sort of shelter because of that, if anything. Um, also, through hikers um, can stay at the Long Trail Inn and they get a discount. And it's really nice. It's, it's that you can get a nice warm shower and you can get a <laughs> shower and a beer. That's right. Mm -hmm. Talking about shelters, uh, is there any shelters you would not recommend to stop? The one with the mice. <laughs> you know how it was, yeah. Well, I can tell you if we want to look at my notes, but. Uh, tell you what, north section, north of the Appalachian Trail, they're all lodges and they're awesome. I've never yeah. seen anything like it before. Yeah. It's really awesome. Uh, so if you were going to just do a section, I'd do the north section, and it's just awesome. Uh, but all the shelters are nice. Rainbow shelter, no, sunrise shelter. If you're going to go to Sunrise Shelter and expect you're going to go there, I did a long day that day because I wanted to get a sunrise. There's no hope of getting a sunrise. It's not even positioned toward the sun. I don't know why they call it Sunrise Shelter. <laughs> it's a nice spot. It's a nice spot, but I don't know why they call it. Is there a shelter where it's close by the, the city and there's sometimes uh, people uh, walking to the shelter? J Peak. There's one on the road on J Peak. It's like 100 yards from the road. Atlas Valley. Huh? Atlas Valley. Atlas Valley. And it's, it's horrendous. And I yeah. will say that a boy shelter is closed right now by the Forest Service because of structural uh, things, but we're fixing it. So that's the only one I can think of. Yeah, Atlas. Oh. Um, Cooper Lodge has been trashed. This is on Killington, has been trashed by the steers. Uh -huh. So it'll smell of uh -huh. stale, stale beer. And there might be beer cans and trash here, but there is a uh, tent site up above it, a uh, tent platform. Pico is having porcupine problems. I was going to stay at Pico Peak, and I passed it up because it had porcupine problems, and I was worried about my dog. So we pressed on. So if you were to stay there, make sure you all buttoned up. We loved Pico. Yeah. Did you? We stayed at Pico. <laughs> there were signs up there in September about porcupines. Yeah. Um, um, a place I wouldn't go is Story Spring. Um, Story Spring Shelter. It's really buggy there, and, and it's just, it's really buggy. In the spring, it's right next to a pond. So. I, I was just going to say on a non-shelter note, um, we stayed at the, um, the Manchester Center Hostel, um, which is awesome. The guy who runs it lives in Ohio. But he has through hiked the whole trail. He'll pick you up from wherever in town. Um, he has a pint of Ben and Jerry's that you can have, free soda, 
washer, dryer, you know, lo like clothes that you can borrow, um, has breakfast stuff that you can make in the morning. He's just like the nicest guy. So that's probably like the, the best place we stayed the whole time. And he's just a super great guy and you can just pretty much eat as much as you want to. <laughs> so I would recommend the hostel in Manchester Center for sure. And he goes, we caught him like one of his last days. He goes pretty much until like about mid-September, maybe beginning of September. What about the in uh, the uh, on the trail? Uh, you, you stop there if you liked it. In at the long trail? trail? Yeah, that place is great. There? I stopped there just for a burger and a beer, and I kept mm -hmm. going. I'm and sorry. there's also a bus that stops right in front of the in at the long trail, so you can catch like we caught a ride down into Rutland. There's a coffee shop, a brewery, a big grocery store, um, a co-op where we got like a lot of fresh fruit and stuff. So. If you stay there, you can also catch the bus pretty easily into town. Excuse me, in Long Trail, is that the place Sherman Pass? Yes. That's Killington, yeah. Yeah, Sherman Pass. Is that for you the long history of the Long Trail? That used to be yeah. GFG? Yes. Yeah, there used to be a club. It's GMC headquarters. Yeah. And the trail used to go right through the building, I believe. Right by it. Right yeah. by it. Like right behind the building. Oh, really? The earliest days. Yeah, there's actually, um, it's built on some rocks, so you have like huge rocks inside the building, because of right where it is, it's really cool. And if you're not a purist, you can hike down to, straight to it, and it's a blue blaze trail now. It used to be the AT, but they shifted it a little bit, but that's still a pretty nice trail. We counted it. <laughs> it used to be the long trail. At the end of the trail, uh, were you able to just walk in? Uh, and get a place, or you have to reserve make a reservation in advance? We reserve, but I think the, if it wasn't a super busy time, you probably could just get a room. We just walked in and got a room. And they do have a hiker's discount. Yep, and you could also do food drops there and also laundry. Uh, Meredith, I don't know if you got a chance to say, do you have any recommendations <laughs> of shelters to stay at or not to stay at? Um, I had a lot of shelters that I loved, and a few of the ones that folks have said this or that may have happened there. I I stayed like I stayed at Pico, and I stayed at Story Spring and Sunrise, and I liked all of those. So I think it really depends what's happening that time of year and what's going on. And there may or may not be some mice. I don't have any to dissuade you from. Um, that being said, you might have a crappy night in a shelter sometime. I don't know. <laughs> Is there any uh, party issue with both either Clarendon or Governor Clement shelters? I stayed oh, there. Excuse me. Or, uh, no, they're uh, they're great shelters to stay at. They're very beautiful. Uh, Governor Clement has got a, got a uh, fireplace in it. Governor yeah. Clement does have Playing a nice fireplace in it. There. And the really great really 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 locals coming yeah. to party there. As well. They closed the road. There was a road that you could get to to get to Governor yeah. Clement that they closed. So. Yep. So now the Governor Clement gate is closed. Uh, yeah. I believe until mid October. After that, it does open up for snowmobilers and ATVers. But uh, that's you know, outside the main town. Three mile can't carry as much beer. Right. Um, there's also right on the road at, near the government. Clement Shelter. If you go straight down the road, there's also a secret shelter, and it's really cool. Um, it's um, a couple that hiked the AT, and they put the made this shelter because they live right near. And the that shelter um, is also really nice because it's real, it's near a, a river, and the fireplace keeps the shelter really warm at night. Hmm. Hmm. Any uh, question? Oops, sorry. Just, just a couple of quick comments hmm. on shelter. First of all, Spruce hmm. Ledge was where the mice were living last fall. <laughs> Don't, that doesn't say they're going to be there this fall. Maybe and I'll move to the next one. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. 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 And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. I don't know if this applies to any of you or the listeners, but as the uh, seniors on the trail why we occasionally needed some rest and one of the few advantages of getting old is that you managed to save up a few dollars and so you can afford to stay in a nice place and there were two uh, that are in the end-to-end -end book that we stayed at that are just were just marvelous uh, one of them is a place called Nye's Green Acres that's actually quite popular with with pardon in Johnson 
I uh, believe mm -hmm. that's where it is. Yeah, it's yeah. in Johnson. And the other one is a place called Phineas Swan, which is a little bit further north. And they're just wonderful places to stay. And, and uh, in addition to which, the proprietors will help you out with things like shoveling back and forth the trail and, and whatever else you need. Uh, yeah, just, um, um, I know, Dick, you brought your dog. Any tips? in terms of hiking oh. with your dog? I'd also like to add on to that. We've had a lot of questions online asking about, um, are there any sections that are too difficult for a dog to do? Uh, you want to stop that one first? Uh, uh, sure, either one. I, I, what I forgot to mention, you said at the time, when you thought you were going to die, the uh, forehead at yeah. Mansfield. Yeah. I thought Thor was going to take me out and I, when I was going over. To t over. I hoisted him up and I really didn't realize as steep it was. By then he'd been doing some steep stuff. He'd been doing stuff. I'd taken my mom watched him coming from the White Mountains. And uh, he got scared. And as I'm piling up over my head, he turned around instead of he came back toward me. I don't have much purchase at all. And one hand grabbed a rock. I don't know how I didn't go over. So then I got to the top of the caretaker and we're talking to him. I says, you know, at the other end, I don't know how I'm gonna do it. And he's like, uh, we took the winter route. There was a bad weather winter route on the backside. So we didn't have to worry about but I would never take the road to Mansfield again. Just wanted to do it. I'd look at some on the long trail. I'd have to look at some other trails. Mm -hmm. That was the only section. Uh, How did he do on ladders? Because we saw some dogs struggling on ladders. He's uh, he if it was a, if it was only one ladder, he couldn't find his way around. But he would look at it and he'd find his way around it. He'd go off the rock. His paws would stick. He'd come back, look at me. He'd come in and he would go along the side of the ladders. We'd go take off in the woods and pop out at the top. Don't know how we did it. <laughs> I didn't care. <laughs> And the, the Devil's Gulch with the aluminum ladder, we go through uh, uh, what's a, 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 no, a valley or something, and uh, we sit there in Austin, there's a 25 foot aluminum ladder bolted to the side of a cliff, sheer cliffs, no way around. Door starts whining, sitting around, I just stop, take my jacket off, eat, look at it, and I had to put him on my shoulders and carry him up. He started to squirm in, but then he settled down, carried him up, tied him to a tree, came back and my other stuff. He's 65 pounds and I had 10 more pounds. So I pat myself on the back and I said, damn, oh yeah, I still got it. <laughs> but, uh, but he was good. But yeah, he always found his way up and around and stuff. Uh, I went to the vet first. This is my first hiking dog I've had. I didn't want another dog. My wife talked me into it, so we got a Wyoming Mountain dog. Uh, and the vet said, what do you do? He says, feed him one third more than you normally do. So we usually give him a cup in the morning, a cup at night, and give him a cup of food for lunch. The other thing is, he says he can carry one third his weight. So I weighed 65 pounds, but I never gave him more than 10 or 12 pounds. I want to go under one third. I know he was good as he's still jumping over logs. He was still running after squirrels and flushing pheasant with the, with the 10, 12 pound pack on. And he was just having a grand old time. The two things the dogs need to learn is they need to stay and come. Only you don't need a smart dog, but they need to do those two things. Because he knows when somebody's coming the opposite direction before you do, and you look at him, he stops, come. Because not everybody likes dogs. People could be allergic. And sometimes he gets over exuberant and he has claws. Or if it's a day packer, if you're on a day trip, nice pair of white khakis and a clean shirt, and they come to the muddy dog, OK? Uh, but those are only two things you need. Stay and come, and you're good to go. In most places, you need to keep on the verbal command. Don't need a leash. You need a leash above Alpine, uh, Mansfield, Camel's Hump, Abraham, put a leash. I read the books. I had him on, didn't argue with the guy. The guy was like, great, like, what, you want a few guys to argue with me? You know what I mean? Uh, but we got it. Other than that, he was leash free. And the long trail is much more dog friendly than the Appalachian Trail is. It really is. Uh, it's nice. Well, I wish everybody who brought dogs on the trail would listen to your advice, because we ran, several times, we ran into uh, dogs that were yipping and yapping, biting at you, and jumping oh, yeah. up and knocking over your food. And, so it, it's, they can be a real nuisance, and I just don't understand why people who can't control their animals even think about bringing them onto a, a place like the Long Trail. There's going to be a, a lot of people. This pack had food, five days of the food in it, which it has now. It had a leash. It had a 10 foot tether to hook it either end. Like the person who was allergic at the, at the hut. Thor loved everybody. I tethered him to a tree, away from the hut, and it's 10 foot leather tether. He didn't like it, but it is what it is. Uh, he had a brush, always brushed the mud out. Uh, we had mole skin with things to wrap his paws. Wasn't sure how his paws were going to do, but ahead of time, I, he went on a lot of walking. We went on local mountains at home, tried to get his paws a little tougher. 
Once again, it's a gentle forest in the Long Trail. It's shady. It's pine needles, not a whole rock, but it's very gentle on his paws. And I was monitoring him constantly because I don't want to carry him. He split his paws, whatever. Uh, shelters, the short leash, I put around my, if there's somebody else in the shelter, he loved you, he wanted to crawl, he wanted to go crawl against you. Once again, not courteous. I had a six foot leash around my wrist that night. He stayed with me and as soon as he moved, I knew it and he kept him away from other people. Uh, some people say it was fine, but you know, just courteous. If I didn't bring a dog, do I want to smell like a dog? Some people didn't care, some people do. Uh, so those are the things, he carried everything in this pack. I had nothing in my pack except for this pad that was blonde with Thor, he carried everything. If you like to carry it around, you can grab it. That's, uh, right now, that is, uh, is four days worth of food, and that is nine pounds. If you want to pass it around, go ahead. This is uh, so I can track them when it gets dark, that's all. I didn't try to pack in the dark, but you want to pass it around. That's a comfortable one, uh, and he loved it. He just, uh, he never did not want to put it on. He knows he puts it on, he can chase critters and do wonderful things. And he just loves it. The roads are tough, and when, when I could hear the traffic, I put the leash on because he chases motorcycles. That'd be awesome, horrible actually. Uh, the shoulders and stuff, and I had the leash on to cross the road and got a quarter mile back into the woods. He always kept me in sight. Uh, like I said, come and stay. So I need and treats. Keep treats in your pockets. Lots of treats. All right. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. I'm gonna go over here first. Yeah, just um, curious. Do you mind if I add on to that? We've had several questions online as well, specifically maybe the uh, women on the panel can attest to this. Uh, how safe did you feel? We've had a lot of women ask that online, so to build off that. Meredith and I were actually just talking about this. Um, I'll just speak from my own experience and she can speak from hers. I saw a lot of young women solo hikers um, and they seemed great and a lot of the caretakers were actually women. Um, there was a fellow at Story Spring who ended up being escorted out, um, but you know, you just, most people just split, or I was there with a group, so it wasn't a big deal, but that was like the only time over 270 miles that we ran into anyone who seemed a little fishy. Um, but all the women that we met who were solo, solo backpacking had no problem. And there were quite a few when I was on it. Um, yeah, we were talking, and oddly, my friend who was a woman and I, who hiked together. Um, we didn't see very many women who weren't with a male partner, but that's sort of aside from the point. We felt very safe. Um, and as far as being alone, I think your experience is gonna be really different depending on the time of the year. So if you're going either early or late season, maybe May or early June, uh, the trail is gonna be a lot lighter traffic, also with late October. We went in August, it was booming, so we ended up hiking every day with a couple of guys who had started by themselves. So it's a very social experience. I think if you're going during the time when a lot of other folks are hiking, maybe July, August, September. Um, and and it, if, you, if you want that, it's a great thing. We had a lot of fun meeting um, plenty of other people and they f said they didn't feel like they were hiking alone by that point. Um, I did like having a partner because we planned together, and I think like Sydney and her dad said, we could lift each other up when we were having a hard time. Um, and and it was just, it was a great shared experience to then take away as well. Like I still see her and we can um, talk about it together, but we never felt unsafe. Um, that being said, I've gone backpacking on the long trail in October and May and haven't seen anyone for four days. So if you want that solitude, I would plan for the shoulder season. <laughs> Yeah, I would say as a guy who grew up in an era where w young women never went any place alone and unescorted, much less out in the middle of the woods, uh, I was really surprised uh, at the number of young single women on the trail. Uh, there are, there, we ran into a lot of them, and uh, it's just, uh, you know, we're just much comfortable and much more at ease about it. So things have changed in the last 60 years. <laughs> yeah. I wish my daughter could do it, but they don't. <laughs> we saw a lot of solo hikers, um, either going southbound or uh, walked with us for a while. And uh, I, I, 
I can I felt safe. Did you feel safe mm -hmm. the whole time? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I did the long trail in 74 when there were no cell phones. Yep. And uh, I did it with a friend. This time I'm doing it solo in my 60s. I feel totally fine about it. I'm not really keen on ha I have to have a cell phone. Well, that's what people tell me anyway. Uh, I do have a flip phone just for emergencies and hiking. And it rarely works, particularly in the Adirondacks. Never had it work. You know, didn't get a signal. So, uh, and I also have AT&T. So, I understand that on tops of mountains that are not wooded, I can hope for reception. I have AT&T. Yeah. No rhyme or reason to it. At Tlaxon Creek, you're in a valley <laughs> where you can see JP, but uh, I have signal there. Sometimes on top, I didn't have signal, no rhyme or reason. Yeah. But they do say that you can send a text message and you don't have signal. And I had mine turned off, I didn't make a charger, didn't want to go dead. I turned it on once a week or every three or four days to text my wife, change the food drop or whatever. But uh, you should bring it for emergencies. Oh Definitely. yeah, I plan to. But I have ATT, and I had signal the spotty, but I had it at least once every three or four days. We also used ours a lot to check the weather. Because um, mm -hmm. if you're out for a couple days and it can just change really fast. So there was one day it was supposed to rain in the morning, then it shifted to the afternoon so we could like shift what we were going to do based on that. But I also had mine and I didn't have it on unless I needed to turn it on. But I didn't, chargers are really heavy so it just didn't really seem worth it. Anyone had um, a spot device or in reach? A spot device? Oh, a spot device. Spot yeah. device from the uh, forest. I've had some experience with those things, and the problem is uh, it's a wonderful concept, but they don't work with the darn in the woods. You, you, if, if, you, if you're going to have an emergency when you have nothing above you, they're fine. They do work, and they will send out a signal. But if you're under a tree, they're useless. More like out west or something. Better yeah. off. And, and the thing is, <laughs> thing I was curious about was why don't they work and yet my, my, my iPhone will pick up satellite signals and let me know where I am. The thing is, the satellite is big and it sends out a pretty strong signal, but when you use that spot device, you have to communicate up to the satellite and then back. And that takes a lot more radio power and, and if you're under trees, it just doesn't work. You're running so many people and everybody's helping, you know? Yeah, so I wouldn't recommend that spot device in, the, in this part of the world. You know, life says out west, they're probably great, but I don't know. Anyone else want to touch on cell phones? Um, I would say that the worst service would be down on the southern end of the long trail. Um, we were not able to contact Beth until we were two days in on our hike. Um, and we had Verizon, and we couldn't get a text message out to her. But we did run into someone who sent a te text message for us, and they had AT&T. So if you are in the most southern extreme part of the state, you might run into some communication issues. But you got all sorts of great ski resorts once you get to um, Manchester North, and there's great service for that. <laughs> all the way up to JP. Yeah. I have a question about um, footwear. What did you guys find was the best? I like these vasques. This is my third pair. I've done a John Rear trail with these, uh, approach Mount Rainier. I really like these vasques. I've been wearing What's them for the V A S Q U E. I've been wearing them forever. This is my third pair. But. Um, we wore trail runners like the ones that I'm wearing and the ones by the bag here. Um, because your feet are gonna get wet no matter what because either the trail is wet or you're gonna sweat. So the sneakers dry easier than the boots and that's why we chose the sneakers. We, just to piggyback on that, we, for Sydney it was difficult for us to decide whether we were gonna spend the money for a pair of boots for one summer that might not even last for a summer. Um, so I think that was the biggest thing. 
But I think our argument was, is yes, our feet are going to get wet, so we need to take care of them. Um, and we had a dry pair of socks every day to replace those, those shoes. Um, some yeah, people say they're lighter, they're less supportive, but we seem to be, we seem to be just fine along the long trail. Can you roll your ankles or anything like that? Awesome. We, um, we prepared before we went. We made sure our ankles were strong enough to go before we just threw on some sneakers and hit the long trail. Um, but we also did get some insoles to help our feet. Mm -hmm. That helped. Awesome. Yeah, we started out with, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we started out with traditional over the ankle hiking boots. Uh, but as we were looking for ways to cut weight, we decided that since we saw a lot of, most everybody you see on the trail is wearing shoes rather than boots, at least that was our experience. And we were a little nervous about having ankle support, but we tried it out and it was, it was fine. I, uh, bought myself a pair of uh, Solomon, I think they're called Equip or something like that. And they were great. My feet were, were perfectly happy. Uh, my partner had trouble finding a hiking boot that would fit, so she ended up taking a pair of very light sneakers. So they were very, very light, but unfortunately her feet were wet all the time. Whereas I didn't get wet at all with these things. One of those things? Yeah, I think it's called Solomon. It's a Solomon boot, and I, th and I know I, it's it's. I think it's called the Equip. Let me just see. Uh, let me get where is where is it? Uh, yeah, here we go. Oh, I'm sorry, not Equip. It's Escape, spelled E S K A P E, and then G T X, which I think stands for Vortex. Okay. And I've seen quite. I saw quite a few of those on the trail, which is why I. Decided to get it here, uh, and uh, I'd say they were, they were great for me. I wore the running shoes that are right up there, um, and I thought they were great. My feet felt good. I didn't have blisters or really like a break-in process. Um, Still plenty of support. Yeah, they felt supportive. They're lightweight. Like Sydney said, they dry fast. Um, What's the brand? These are Sacconi. Um, I They're just random shoes. They're, I didn't get these for any specific purpose. A lot of people wear Solomon running shoes out there. I hear they are more, um, just a little sturdier. They're, they're like the intense long distance trail runner type shoe. But um, my partner just had Adidas trail running shoes. So um, I think- Did you think just that one pair or did you- I actually started with a different pair of running shoes that I'd had for like three years and they kind of already had holes in them. And then the <laughs> holes got bigger after like four days. So I stopped in um, Rutland and, and got those at the <laughs> shoe store. Um, what I meant was you always wear the same pair every day. You alternate your dry Oh no, out. yeah, mm. too much weight. <laughs> you put on one pair of 20 days and really probably wet shoes. And a lot of people take camp shoes. Um, Crocs. Crocs are pretty heavy. They're not, they're not lightweight shoes. Yeah, these are probably a pound for the pair, which is, which can be great. Like some people love them. I didn't take camp shoes. Um, you, and need, then, you need to rest your feet at the end of the day. I take them off just to rest your feet. I took my shoes off. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> yeah so if it seemed um, like rudy or uneven, then I would just throw my shoes on barefoot if I needed to go far away. But just one pair of shoes did it for us. Um, I can't remember what brand of my shoes, but they were just low hikers. Um, one tip that I got from uh, someone last year, I think Gray J, who's done it many, many times, yeah. recommended um, plastic bags if it rains. And I've actually done that before. And especially if it's not really hot, just put it over your socks and then it keeps your socks dry. And then it's just good to have like a plastic bag, I don't know, for trash or something anyway. And then for camp shoes, I just had a pair of Toms, which are kind of like slippers anyway, and they're super duper light. Just something to wear that's like, just taking your shoes off at the end of the day is, Awesome. <laughs> I guess I, I guess you know I really want to should talk about our system. We knew that our feet were going to get wet, and that we knew we had to take care of our feet. Sydney and I carried three pairs of socks. One pair of socks were our camp socks. They stayed in a bag. They were always dry. We always knew we had a dry pair of socks when we got to camp. Um, 
And then we had two other pairs of socks. One was on our feet, of course, and the other pair was always washed and hanging on our bags to dry. Um, so every day we at least had a fresh, semi-fresh clean yep. pair of socks compared to the other ones. So, you know, that was really our system. When we got to camp, we had, we threw the Crocs on, we had dry, dry feet, dry socks, and then we washed our other socks, hung them on the dry, on our bag, and knew that we had um, a pair ready to go the next morning. Hopefully they were dry, not all days they were, but most of the time they were. So that, so we really, if you're gonna use the trail runners, non-Gore-Tex route, um, you really kind of have to plan ahead and have a system and know that your feet are going to get wet and that you're going to have to, you know, take care of them. And you get used to having wet feet. I got a good trip for you. Works 100%. Wet sucks. And if shoulder seasons, you have a burning glove that get wet, and you go to bed at night, maybe trench them wet, put them up against your skin. Tuck them in the bottom, up against your torso, skin to skin. It's cold for a few minutes, but in the morning your socks will be toasted dry every morning. Oh. You have a dry pair, it works. Oh, wow. Toasted we, dry. When we hiked, um, we used the darn tough socks because they, um, they were really good for hiking because they kept our feet, um, most of the time they kept us from getting blisters and they helped to keep our feet semi-dry. And they're also made in Vermont, which is really good. Cool. <laughs> hey, Brian, you mentioned that you worked on your ankles before your trip. You strengthened your ankles. We made, we made sure when we, were, when we threw a rock in our bag that we were wearing our sneakers and we were hitting the trail. We were getting our ankles prepared for the long trail. It's brutal. Um, like they said before, if it's not ready if it's if you don't have you know um, roots on the trail it's rocks or most of the time you're walking in a stream bed so if it's raining you're walking in a river um, muddy. muddy i mean Lots it was a treat to walk on flat even ground I mean, <laughs> it, you know you spend a lot of time looking at your feet because foot placement is really important on the, on the long trail. It is brutal. It is not an easy walk, for there sure. There was a lot of times when we were walking in mud on roots and with rocks, sort of tripping and falling into just mud, pits of mud. <laughs> so I guess to answer your question is, use your equipment before you go on the trail. Practice with it. Get in shape for it, because you're going to have to rely on it once you're out there. Yeah, one thing on that, don't believe the nickname for the long trail, which is a path in the wilderness. <laughs> it's a jungle. <laughs> and they're not gentle rolling hills either. <laughs> Ticks. Oh, yes, yeah. so we did have um, a couple questions online asking about ticks. Did you guys do tick prevention? Did you tuck your pants in your socks? See any ticks? Anything like that? We didn't see any ticks. Neither did we. I can shorts the whole time. Never had a single tick on Thor either. In September, October, you wouldn't either, probably. We didn't see any ticks at all. Any other questions? Yeah. On average, uh, do you know uh, how much weight uh, was uh, your, your backpack, including the water? Mine was 30, 35 pounds. With five days, six days of the food, 35, 40 of the food, closer to 30. You can, you can judge your food two pounds a day, you get enough food. I had 10, between 15 and 20 pounds on average. That's how you do it. <laughs> I, had, I had 35 pounds when I had all the food and water. So fully loaded, I was 35 pounds walking down the trail. Yeah, uh, for us, the upper limit when we were uh, backpacking was about 25 pounds. And, and uh, the days we were, which was about half the days when we were day hiking, we had about 12 pounds. Um, my bag was usually 15 to 18 pounds. Wow. Wow. So no camp shoes. No camp shoes. <laughs> or a tent. A tent. <laughs> but everything you need. Absolutely everything you need. Yeah. Our, ours was, well, mine and um, Tater's were around 33, 35. 
but we also had a lot of really good food. So. <laughs> Do you wish you had, uh, I mean, you, you were at 35, would you have wanted to bring it down lower? Yes. I wish I was 10 pounds less. Yeah, <laughs> same. 10 pounds less. 10 pounds. Absolutely. Yeah. 35 is a good weight for me. I don't even feel like I have it on. I, mean, I do a lot of wow. winter camping. I have 50, 60 pounds. When I get on to 30, 35, that's awesome. No yeah. worries for me. I really dreaded resupply because I carried food for Beth or for Sydney and myself. So resupply was a lot of extra weight on my yeah. back. And I could really feel the difference when uh, we're heading back up into the woods. Yeah. Yeah, same. I mean, no, we wish we would have ditched the tent for sure and some other things because. Low 30s is pretty heavy. Yeah, well, I used to hump around a 60, 70 pounds <laughs> back in the days, but uh, not anymore. Uh, every, time, every time both my partner and I looked at that pack, we said, what can we leave behind? Yeah. <laughs> the way I like to think about weight is comfort. So um, if you have a lighter pack, it's going to be more comfortable. And if, you have more, if it's more comfortable, you're going to have more fun. Um, and I never dreaded putting my backpack on or anything like that. That being said, though, if you're going to be really uncomfortable without something that weighs a little bit more, you should take that and sort of, as you're packing, really assess everything you have. And like, ultralight all the way isn't necessarily the answer if you need this one thing that's going to make you more comfortable. But the just in case attitude of like, well, maybe just in case I'll be more comfortable adds up over time, and then all of a sudden you're five, seven, ten pounds heavier. Um, so, so think it out, and like Ryan said, test your system probably for an overnight or, or a really long day hike beforehand, um, and see what you use and what you don't use. And my advice is eliminate the things you don't, and and you'll have everything you need. Um, but like I always bring a sleeping bag because I get really cold. My partner doesn't bring a sleeping bag. He just uses a bivy sack, which is like... There's nothing to it, yeah. Yeah, it's like a small sack um, that sort of insulates your body heat and um, keeps out the wind. But he doesn't get as cold. So that's just an example of, of what makes you most comfortable. And everybody's going to have that one thing. And if it's an extra five pounds, but it makes the trip worth it for you, then go for it. But in general, a lighter pack, in my experience, is more fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you all bring I got something similar to her, it's a big Agnes, it's three inches thick, it has no insulation value, you can't use it one at a time, but it's really, really comfortable. Yeah. And I take my blue tarp all the time, I wrap it, because Thor has claws, and would pop it, I know he would, so I wrap it in the blue tarp. Sometimes you're on the wood shelter, the wood floor of the shelter, which is not super comfortable, so I think having some good padding is pretty key if you want to try to sleep. Yeah, we needed something soft under it, so we, we used a, it's a thermal rest product called Neo Air. And comfort-wise, they were great, but they have two big disadvantages. Uh, one is that they're very noisy. Every time you move, they crunch and crackle, and they annoy everybody in the shelter. And the other is that you keep sliding off of them, so that they're, they really don't, we really didn't come up with a good solution to them comfortable pad issue. Um, a lot of people online have asked about rain. How did you deal with rain and what did you carry to uh, keep yourself dry? I love talking about rain. <laughs> um, I use a rain jacket, but a lot of people just don't even put on their rain jacket because a lot of the times if it's really downpouring, you're going to get wet anyway. Um, but my favorite thing is the rain skirt, um, <laughs> which goes on over, and so your shorts don't get wet, but it's really lightweight, um, and you don't have to like put on pants or something, but if you're just wearing a jacket, sometimes the bottom half will get wet. And my partner wore a black one, so she didn't even have to wear her shorts underneath when she was wearing it, <laughs> but I did. Did you make that? Yeah. No, I bought it at a store. That's probably yeah, I made it. pounds. <laughs> it's just a trash bag. It's like 18 pounds, yeah. <laughs> but these are really fun to make and, and keep your legs dry. Do you have a YouTube dry. video showing how to make it? <laughs> um, when we did rain, we had, um, I had rain pants that I only used once. We had our rain jackets that we used not very often. 
And then we had our, um, to keep our stuff on the inside of our bag dry, we took garbage bags and wrapped our stuff in it. So we put one big garbage bag in and then we tightened it all together and rolled up the top and then tightened our bag together and we wrapped our sleeping bag in its own and then our stuff wouldn't get wet. And we used, um, and then we had a, a pack co cover, which we didn't really use, but it also kind of helped. So I, I didn't, what we ended up doing is just taking compactor bags and we would line the inside of our bag and, and put stuff inside that compactor bag and roll it up to keep the rain out. Um, so you did it here with the sleeping bag. Um, just wrap the sleeping bag on the inside of the bag. It might be add a little weight, um, but we found that when it was time to really kind of get ready for the rain, the rain cover over the bag wasn't always effective. Um, and when you're walking with a rain jacket, um, when you're walking with a rain jacket, you're sweating on the inside anyways, so I felt like I was always overheated. I've always taken my jacket on and off, and so I did not really enjoy walking in the rain very much at all because of that. I was never dry anyways, and I was either overheated or I was trying to find that fine balance of staying warm. Um, I, if someone could find a perfect system for walking in the woods in the rain and be comfortable and dry, I, 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 see, I, see, I saw a lot of through hikers with umbrellas, and I think that's probably the most effective way to do it. <laughs> I couldn't see that with an umbrella, but uh, I have a rain jacket that I wear when I was done hiking. Same thing, I could wear them inside the word hiking, so I usually had a hat, uh, keep my head dry, shorts, pair of gators to keep my feet dry. Uh, I don't know if gators have to go to the top of your boots. Yeah. Long way, but I would put this on after. When I'm done hiking, put on a dry shirt, throw this on so I can make my meal, get my water, do what I have to do, even though it's still raining. But I wouldn't wear it hiking either, just shorts, and I just get wet. I think I use my rain jacket more at camp than I did yeah. on the trail. That's a good just get a good wicking shirt, you know, a dry fit that dries quicker. No cotton at all, cotton's a death garment. And uh, yeah, cotton will never dry. My feeling about rain, I don't mind getting wet. That wasn't my concern. The thing I don't like about rain is that it makes a rugged, difficult to hike on trail treacherous because now everything is slippery as well as uneven and difficult. And in fact, that's what contributed to our accident. And after that, we decided we needed a foolproof way to avoid that sort of situation. And we came up with a wonderful solution which worked for the rest of the trek, which was you listen to the weather forecast, and if there's white rain in the forecast, you don't go hike. <laughs> it worked perfectly. I also like line my bag, like they did, yep. um, just with a trash bag, as just to enter, and then I put everything inside that. It's important to note: she used white. I use white. Do you use white one. We use white. Guys, if you use black, you can't see anything in your bag. Use white. <laughs> and the compacted bags are thicker, but you got to use white, definitely. Otherwise, you can't find anything. And the trash compactor bags are different from the garbage bags. Thicker. They're, 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 yeah. they're, 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 they're really they're durable. durable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Trekking poles. Pros and cons. Um, we, we, my husband and I started out with two trekking poles, but I noticed that I needed one to be able to grab onto stuff, especially when you're going down like a tree, you know, a branch or something like that. So we ditched them, and then we each just had one that we used, which was kind of just like having a walking stick. But sometimes it was really helpful just to have that extra leverage when you're going downhill and there's just a rock slab and there's nothing to grab onto. I use one pole. I, have, I never used them the first 30 years, but I'm 56 and my knees are going. And I use one pole for going down. I love it. Like I like having the oh, extra hand. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, I don't use them for going up. That's it. Um. We used the trekking poles. We didn't use them when we were on the flats or when we were going. We didn't really use them when we were going down unless it was very steep. And that helped us from not falling. And we used two. 
and then we also, and then um, he ended up great. One of his broke, so he ended up with one. Um, I still had two at the end, and we found that it was much easier to use them going up than it was to go down. Good job. Yeah. I would say if you're over 70, don't go on a long trail without poles. <laughs> uh, because it's not just less wear and tear on your joints, but it's balance. Balance is the first thing to go, and having those extra couple of contact points with the ground uh, in some cases is just essential. I'm not 70, and I love hiking poles. <laughs> uh, I take two, and I really like them for going up. And also going down is nice balance. I always put the wrist straps on, so if I need to grab something, I'll just sort of drop it and like grab it and the pole will hang from your wrist. Um, and I also, I, I use them all the time just because I think it helps you get into a really nice flow, but they're not necessarily, you don't have to have them, I don't think. Don't you get any blisters if you are all the time? Nope. I think if you were gripping it really no. hard, maybe, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably wouldn't be. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I have two not really related questions. What did you do uh, for storing food at night? Uh, do you hear me? Mm -hmm. no. Storing food at night. Storing food at night. And then what kind of cold weather layer did you bring? Because I know like in the mornings and at nights, it would be a really different temperature than all day. So cold weather and food storage. My cold weather is also my sleeping um, when it's warm outside. So if it's like June through September, I have one outfit for hiking, which is shorts and a t-shirt, and then white one outfit for sleeping, which is um, tights and a long sleeve. And then I have a thin puffy jacket like this. So when it gets cooler, I put on those sleeping clothes because um, I'm not gonna be sweating anyway. And then, um, just change once it gets warmer. Um, I, um, when we got to camp, we had fleece pants, a long synthetic shirt, um, and then we also had a fleece, which kept us very warm because it gets cold at night, even though it's in the summer. It gets pretty cold. You can wake up and you're, you can see your breath. It's so cold. Um, and then you, um, then we used our rain jackets a lot for in the wind, but we didn't really have anything else. Yep, you, you pretty much hit it on the nose. We had synthetic um, t-shirts, and then if we needed another layer, we had um, some fleece. And if we needed something to break the wind, then we would use our rain jackets to break the wind. Um, and that's really all we needed. Um, we didn't even bring pants. We brought some pants for camp clothes, mm -hmm. but we hiked in the rain and the wind with just shorts because you're active and you're moving and, um, and you, you stay pretty warm that way. Mm -hmm. Layers, layers, layers. Yeah. I would like to make one comment on clothing. One, one piece of type of clothing that I discovered is merino wool. It is the most marvelous stuff because it wicks well and it dries quickly, but most importantly, it doesn't stink. It's un unbelievable. I'm a heavy perspirer and I'm, I've tried a million different materials. I'm on the trail for an hour and it's unbearable, the odor, okay? Merino wool, I can go on the trail for days. It's fresh as a rose. It's just amazing <laughs> stuff. Just amazing. If my socks made out of they're awesome, the socks. Yeah. <clears throat> I use a down vest. I like to weigh six ounces. My torso always gets cold. So at the end of the day, I put on a dry shirt. I only bring a second shirt. The shirt I'm wearing, another short sleeve shirt, and this thing. So at the end of the day, I put on a dry shirt, put this on, and it's really cold. I throw on my, my raincoat because it condenses it. And six ounces, and this thing's awesome. And my torso gets cold. At night, I'm in my sleep bag. I go, I'm, I do 10 or 15 miles. I'm asleep by 6.37 p.m. <laughs> and then the dog wakes me up at 5 in the morning. So I'm in bed for look when it gets cold. When you're up around at night, I'm sleeping in my sack, you know. I'm old. Not as old as you, but I'm old. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so my sleeve back to my well, primary pain. Years. Years. I know. <laughs> But yeah, but the down vest, six ounces, doesn't weigh anything, and it's awesome. The only other thing I'd add is a lightweight winter hat. And if it's cold at night, then you know maybe your head's popping out, especially if you don't have a mummy bag or you don't want to put it on. And it's nice in the morning, too. And then you can easily just like stuff it in your pocket. So, And obviously, a lot of heat escapes through your head. So I would definitely recommend that, even in the summer, for the evenings, too. What about mosquitoes, black flies? Don't hike in May and June. That's what I want in September. Yeah, there, weren't, there, weren't, there wasn't anything in September. July, or October. August, September, October, the bugs are non existent. Yeah. So. It was not bad for us. We hiked in June, June end of June, July, and during July, and when we finished, and by the whole time we we might have gotten a couple of mosquito bites, but we didn't get much. Um, we've had a question online, and uh, feel free to not answer this if you don't want to, but can anyone touch on personal hygiene on the trail? Like, cleaning okay. up at the end of the night? And I got like no that. shame. Sure. <laughs> I got no shame. <laughs> Toothbrush, toothpaste. So you don't need soap, don't need stupid deodorant, don't know any, anything like that, because everybody smells the same. Uh, <laughs> not quite. And I get a, well, when you're going through, you know, I mean, yeah, I guess. And uh, I got a favorite pair that I've used, like I was using the John Muir Trail, a lot of 10-day trips. Uh, Under Armour underwear. Just a pair, under, like $40 for a pair, black. You can wear them for two, three weeks solid. You can forget you got them on. It's not a problem. You don't have to change. <laughs> um, we brought our toothbrushes and toothpaste and we brought them in, so you put the bottom, you like flip ones, or you can make get the ones where you um, take them out and put them into a case thing that's part of it. Um, those are what we used, and then we used a small little tube of toothpaste. Um, and then we brought um, like other s stuff, like for him, his contact things, and, uh, we brought some Dr. Bronner soap, which is you you can use for ev almost everything. It's really good, and you can get it. It's really nice. Oh. I also forgot his hand sanitizer. Little bottles of hand sanitizer. You put one in your cooking pot. So when you go to cook, you hand sanitize your hands. Mm -hmm. You put one in your little toilet paper. So you come out of the tree, you sanitize your hands. Always sanitize, and you don't really you don't forget it. The things everywhere. I actually just brought those little wet wipes, which even if you don't care about hygiene, sometimes it just feels nice to like wipe <laughs> off your face in the morning before you start hiking, get all the salt and the grime off. You can you, you know, use it after you use the privy as well. So, I mean, like Meredith is saying, the comfort, it's a little bit extra weight, but you just, it's amazing how good it actually feels. <laughs> I really like um, rinsing off your feet and your face at the end of the day in the stream downstream of the water source feels great and um, because it was warm when we hiked we swam every chance we got and that makes you feel pretty clean yeah. um, and I, I take a little bar of soap for the same thing like wash your hands after you go to the bathroom because that's the biggest thing that's gonna make you sick over a lot water contamination issue um, yeah just just splashing your face in a stream as you pass makes you feel good, and brushing your teeth. Yeah. And just a, another GMC PSA, uh, please don't use soap in the water sources, walk, yeah. uh, walk it away. And um, also, wet wipes, tampons, trash, anything other toilet than toilet paper. paper does not decompose in the privy, so please don't throw it in there. And toilet paper doesn't really decompose in the woods either, and that was one thing, unfortunately, I saw a lot of toilet paper out in the woods, so pack it out. Yeah. If you're going to do it, put it in a plastic bag and pack it out, yeah. especially if you find it by the water source. Yeah. You're just like, oh, God. <laughs> and for women, if, um, so if you're on your period and you're using tampons, um, what I do is take a plastic baggie of baking soda, and you can put them in there. And so they're sort of in something, it neutralizes everything, um, keeps it contained, and then if you want, you can put that in like a black trash bag or something and, and dispose of it next time you're in a town. 
Um, and that, if that's something you have to deal with, which is the reality of Baking stuff. Being, being a woman on a trail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything to add other than we talk about everybody smells the same, and I'd say that that's true most of the time. There was one time when a guy came into the shelter. It was a closed four-wall shelter, and he says, I hope nobody is offended because I think I smell a little bit, and it was unbearable. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> you'll, you'll find people at different, like, hygiene levels on the trail. I mean, we all do. <laughs> we, all, we all do smell. Um, Sydney and I were, you know, we were using our little toothbrushes, and we heard this buzzing. And um, a friend of ours, Bacon, if you're out there, yes, we're talking about your electric toothbrush. <laughs> that, that was his luxury item. He says everyone gets one luxury item, and that's one thing he felt like he couldn't live without. So, you know, you'll see all sorts of different levels of hygiene, some non-existent, and some bring it all. <laughs> I'll tell you, one of the things that amazed me is especially the young women on the trail, not only that they were there, but they always looked like they just came out of the shower in the beauty bar. They were <laughs> spotless. And here I am all cake with mud. I've only been out for an hour and I'm all money. And they just look spotless. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> um, I lead uh, hikes for the Green Mountain Club, and so I have a fairly extensive, perhaps too extensive, first aid kit, and I keep culling and culling. So I'd like to know what are the essentials that you take and maybe what are the things that you feel you, well, you realize you could ditch behind and conversely the ones that you said, ooh, I wish I had brought that. Uh, just to keep an eye on time, if uh, you keep your answers fairly brief, that would be fantastic. Yeah, well, I'll take a shot at that. I, I think that for me the two essential things are, uh, one, a, um, an ace bandage because ankles are probably the most common thing I've run into, not for myself, but other people. So having an ace bandage is, I, I think, is, a, is any other one is, is the life-saving one, is, is something to deal with serious cuts. So uh, sanitary pads, lots of gauze, and stuff like that. As far as other things, um, you know, I do carry a, a tick remover, but I've never used it. Uh, uh, and other things, you know, Maybe, maybe something, a few tablets good for constipation or, or diarrhea, probably a couple of things. Other than that, you know, if it's pain, hey, you know, you can deal with pain for a couple of days, but it's, it's really the life-preserving stuff that you need. Of course, the group, you need moleskin. It's not everybody's same kind yeah. of you. You yeah. have a bigger kid, you have a group with a smaller kid. I, I was a scout master, I bring six Boy Scouts, I got a big kit, if it's me and the dog, I had a couple of these moleskins, some duct tape, a Band-Aid, and ibuprofen. And uh, ace bandage, you know? Well, oh, Vince, what size? Um, Sydney had a fall on, uh, Camel's, hump. on Camel's Hump, no, and no. she split her knee open um, to the point that maybe she should have had sutures. Um, what I did have with me was hand sanitizer, toilet paper, duct tape, and super glue. You know. <laughs> those, those are the things that I brought. I knew that if we had sprained ankles, if we had anything, you know, like that, you know, we could manage with not having them. But I knew if we had blood and we needed to control some bleeding, this is some of the stuff that we needed. We needed to sanitize and close it up and so we can get to where we need to and assess at that point. Um, and Sydney was able to, after we got it cleaned up, we realized that you know she was okay. A um, little bit of super glue, a little bit of duct tape, and she was able to move on from that. Um, ridge runners, I, they are very helpful. They saw Sydney's injury and they had first aid kits, and they were happy to help her out with that. Um, and they realized that it was pretty clean, and we did a pretty good job, and they let us move on. So um, think about the worst, and think about the least amount of stuff, because a first aid kit is something that you hope you never need, but if you bring too much stuff, it's a lot, if that makes sense. It took up a lot of space in our bag, but it, we obviously used it, so it's important. Yeah, one thing we did that I would recommend, which doesn't add any zero weight to your pack, no. is 
we took the uh, one of the solo wilderness first aid courses, two day course before we uh, did the trip uh, trek, and uh, you learn a lot of useful things on those things, uh, mostly prevention and how to recognize the really serious life threatening problems. <laughs> So, uh, sorry, I don't mean to cut you two off from your first aid kit, but we are okay. basically out of time. So to close, uh, I just want to thank everyone. Thank you guys so much for coming. And if you could go down the line and just say, like, your one quick best piece of advice you'd give for someone wanting to end end. Bring a pillow. <laughs> um, when you're hiking, try to find some nice people to hike with, because it's about what, who you meet on the trail. And that's most of what happens, and that's really a huge part of that. Just do it. It took me 30 years to get out, make the time to do this. And I wish I hadn't taken. I should have done it five times by now. Just do it. Get out there, and make the time, do it. <laughs> yeah, mine would be simply stay zoned in all the time, especially when you're walking on wet rocks and tree roots. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would say just do it. You, you, you figure it out. And in Vermont, it's always important to be safe, but you're never very far from other people, from safety, from like, just, just, just figure it out. <laughs> just do it and like, be flexible, I guess. Um, I would say don't be afraid to take your time. Sometimes we got caught up of like, oh my god, they did so many more miles than we did. Um, it's really not about that. Everyone says hike your own hike, but you look at the registers and they're like, I did 30 miles a day, I did 50, you know, and you start feeling like the competitiveness, but we just really wanted to enjoy it and to, you know, take time off and to go swimming and to notice the trees and the views and go that extra point one to Killington. You know, I just would say if you have the time, take the time because, you know, it's a beautiful trail with so many little hidden features and, you know, you want to enjoy every minute of it. Well, thank you guys so much again for making the drive. We really appreciate it. Let's get a hand. Yeah.